anyway. That, but that's pretty lengthy, and I'm, we're just real great. Just, you, know, it, you know, it's a privilege to pray for people. I want you to know every time I pray, I'm believing God. I'm not praying a token prayer. Can you say amen? Yeah, we're believing God. I, I believe for good reports uh, to hear something. Well, listen, gonna, uh, uh, I might preach two messages along this line, but it, it'd be good even if I just do it as a standalone. Uh, you, you, you'll like this. Uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk about a kingdom of priests tonight. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word, to teach, and to preach your gospel. We thank you, Father, that your word's good seed and is it sown on good ground, that it brings forth good fruit. And we thank you, Lord, for these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Do me a favor here. Uh, uh, if you walk this to the back, it's trying to load, and I'm too far from the hot spot. Let's see if it doesn't. <coughs> Why don't you go ahead and bring up my first slide? You know, most of this, I, I, I know some of the material. I won't have to have it in front of me. Thank you, Lord. We're going to talk about, once again, a kingdom of priests. It's just a, it's just a tremendous subject. You know, I was raised, I was raised a Catholic. And I'm, I'm not the guy that's this huge anti-Catholic guy. Uh, I learned some things as a young Catholic boy that I've kept with my life all these years. Listen to me, the... Catholic Church did teach me. I went, I went to Catholic school, too, for a number of years. I had an hour of religion every day. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just some things that I tell you that I learned, you know, because, you know, some people just think, well, you know, you know, the, you know, the Catholics, it's, you know, it's, it's cultic. Listen, there's some doctrine there that I don't agree with. Anybody who has a personal relationship with Christ is a Christian. I don't care, you know, what, you know, what, their, what their background is. Uh, I often share with people, you know, before you before you do get too up in arms over the Catholics, just remember this: they are the ones, the monks, uh, the Catholic monks, who hid away in monasteries and kept the Scripture copied for centuries, or we wouldn't have Scripture. And uh, so, you know, I I just don't always take the positions that every everybody else taking a position. I don't care who says it. I don't, I don't have to I don't have to believe what they believe. Uh, you know, they've trusted Christ. So I, I learned a lot of good things, you know. I knew, that the, I, I knew that Adam didn't need an apple. I came here to Houston, Missouri. I won't tell you what church I went. Some of my friends invited me to go to church, see. They need to get this Catholic kid saved. And he did need saved, all right? I was a lost one. And they took me to church, and so they're, they're talking about the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and so anyway, they, they, ask about, uh, uh, they ask about what happened in, what happened in the Garden. And uh, I'm telling you, kids been raised in church, raising their hands, saying, well, you know, they, they ate an apple. And, uh, and so, they, you know, they, they bounced that around for a little while. And I said, uh, I, I, mean, I, I said I, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm pretty sure that it doesn't say that he ate an apple. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and they, you know, and they all looked at me, you know, like, you know, well, you shouldn't know anything. You're lost. You know, but of course, I you know, I, I I knew that Satan was Lucifer, a fallen angel, and a third of the angels fell with him. See, I, I was taught that. Understood that Christ's sacrifice alone was a sacrifice for sin. Now there were some other things that I was taught that once again it wasn't. But again, I learned some good things. But here here is where I'm so grateful that after I got saved, I come to learn. As a boy growing up in the Catholic Church. We had to go to confession pretty often, you know, because we really were heathens. And, uh, and so we'd go to confession. A lot of times we'd go to confession on Friday. That way we'd feel a little bit better about Sunday. <laughs> True story. And uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, we'd go to confession on, you know, on, on Friday night. And, and then, you know, and there would be some people there and there would be along the walls where these confessionals where priests were in there and we we were taught this that you had to confess your sins to a priest to receive absolution forgiveness so you know this is what we do we'd sit around we'd think now i lied to my mom five times i fought with my sister six times you know, I stole something from the grocery store, candy bar, you know. Uh, you know, things like that, you know. Uh, I won't tell anything else. That's enough. And 
And so anyway, that, uh, you know, we would, uh, we would go and we'd list these out and they would tell us, okay, you got to say, this is what the rosaries were for. The rosaries were to help you to count your, your penance. You know, this is, this is what you do to get forgiven. You had to offer penance. And so they'd say, say, say a dozen Hail Marys and say 15 Our Fathers and, and do 10 active contritions. I can still do all of them, you know. And, uh, uh, and, and so, and then when you did that, all was good, all right? You know, I, at least we were taught that, you understand. And I don't want to make light of it, you know. I, I think there's too much of that in the church, but that's the way it was. And then I got saved. And I found out that I had an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I want to talk about a kingdom of priests. All of that impacts our lives. Let's begin in 1 Peter 2.9. I want to tell people, if you're listening online, we appreciate probably several people because uh, not having youth tonight listening online. We appreciate it. Let us know that you're there. Uh, like it, love it, say something about it. If you've got a question, I try to look at the questions in the aftermath. If you've got a prayer request, you post that, and we'll be faithful to pray. I do like telling people, you know, when you put a prayer request in the uh, in the offering, uh, uh, they do get those prayer requests to me, and uh, we certainly go before the Father. We lift those things up in prayer. And so, again, we appreciate everybody that's with us online. First Peter 2, nine, But you are a chosen... Oh, let's read it together. This is a great verse. Read it together with me. Say, 1 Peter 2, nine. All right, let's say it together. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, <coughs> excuse me, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is a great verse. This is a great truth for people of faith. We are what? A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. You and I live in a dispensation, a time period called grace. Oh, am I grateful? You know, the law was necessary. I like this, Andrew Murray says, the law was necessary, but it was absolutely insufficient. Absolutely ins insufficient. We live under grace, and under grace, we don't have a priesthood. We don't have a Levitical priesthood that must regularly offer up sacrifices for our sins. We don't have to take a sacrifice for our sin. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now Martin Luther, who, once again, what he did by nailing his theses about, refer, you know, about the just living by faith. And Martin Luther said this, the word priest, see, because he, what he was, is he was, he was becoming a Catholic priest, or was a Catholic priest. And he began to see that anybody could approach God by faith. And he said, this word priest shouldn't be, what he's saying is, should not be unique. Should not be unique. It is not for a select group of, of people. See, uh, uh, there were several orders of priests in the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, one of them was, a, you could be a Benedictine priest. You could be a Jesuit priest. That's just a couple of them. You could belong to a certain order of priests, see. But he said, this word priest should become as common as the word Christian. And the reason is, is because all Christians are priests. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, when we say that, when we're talking about in Christ, right, you, know, we, we, you know, we live in the flesh, right? We have to live in this physical body. But the real you is, is spiritual. It's a part of you that's going to last forever. And in Christ, Galatians 3.28, I love this verse, and it's, it's enormously important to me. In this verse, it says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female, for all are one where? In Christ Jesus. 
This verse says three things to me. First of all, there is no social dif distance difference. So whether you're a janitor or a congressman, it doesn't make any difference. In their day, whether or not you were a, a slave or a free person, and you understand that the gospel was probably overwhelmingly communicated to many people who were slaves. I've often said that, you know, in the Greek, in the Greek culture, somewhere near 70 to 80 percent of the culture were slaves. In the Roman culture, it was around 50 percent. So you can see why he's got to communicate this, Dennis. You know, it doesn't make any difference if you're a slave or you're free. Now, here'd be another big deal. In their day, it was very, it was a very male-dominated society, uh, very patriarchal. And I'm not saying that this society is still not, but you, you will all agree we've come a long way. Isn't that right? Yeah. And I say the same thing about race. Now, Again, I know that there would not be everybody that would, you know, that would see, you know, women. You understand, in gender, we're different. But listen, I, you know, when, when we're talking about when we're talking about in a relationship with God, I, I would even say socially, you know, we, you know, there's certainly no difference intellectually. There, there is no difference in the ability to lead. And, and you've heard me say this. I'm a guy that believes in, I don't just believe in it, I can prove it from Scripture. I believe in women in ministry. And this verse helps substantiate it, but I got a lot of other verses, a lot of other verses. You know, when you got to spend all your time explaining something away, you're probably not on good ground. There's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, all right? Male nor female. I, you know, I, 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 would, I would challenge anybody, you know, to. Uh, you know, to, to, to look at a Jenny Roberts in Africa and question whether or not there's legitimacy to her ministry, or a lady who's come here often, Judy Tillett, or the woman who spent six, 16 weeks here in 2001, the black evangelist who came to our church, and the 267 people that got born again the first time. Can you say amen? Yeah. So again, there's no gender difference. And then we find this, there's no Jew nor Greek. There's no ethnic difference. There is what? Scripture teaches us, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We are what? A holy nation. So, you know, if you were to go to Germany and they would say that we are a, we're a nation of Germans. And if you would go to China, they would say we are a nation of Chinese. And the same in Africa, other places in the world. You understand. But the Bible says this to you and I. We are a royal priesthood. We are what? This is our nation. In Christ, it's a holy nation. I love it. His own special people. And that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and again into his, his marvelous light. What a, what a privilege, what an honor when you think about the God of the universe says that you, you're, you're, you're a chosen generation, a, a royal priesthood, a, a, a holy nation. You know, he, he saw us, he, he called us, he, he chose us. Now, the word show forth says this, it would be the same as saying to share, to share with others. New Century Version says this, you were chose to tell about the wonderful acts of God. Yeah. Often scripture talks about us being ambassadors. The word ambassador means this, it's an ambassador of the highest calling. An ambassador of the highest calling. You know, so we, you know, you just... You know, you're not, you know, you're not just, you know, uh, representing parents at the PTA. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's important stuff. Uh, uh, you're, not, you're not just representing a country. You're representing a kingdom, kingdom of God. You were chosen to tell others about the wonderful acts of God. See, we've been given this ministry. It's called reconciliation, to reunite people with God, to, to invite them. There's this, when we read this verse, it tells us this, there is a new order of priests. 
In the Old priest in the Old Testament, there was the Aaronic priesthood, came from the tribe of Levite. It was all about genealogy. And if you belong to the tribe of Levi, you could belong to the Aaronic priesthood. But if you didn't, you could not be in the priesthood. But the scripture teaches us once again, there is a, there is a new order. Uh, Hebrews 7.11, the NIV says, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of the law was given to the people, why was there still a need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. Now Aaron was, a, he was Moses' brother. And, and certainly what an honor to be chosen to have the priesthood in the Old Testament called after you. I, I don't want to marginalize that at all. And how special it would be to, to be a Levite and, and, and to give attention to the, to the things of God and to the tabernacle and, and offer up sacrifices and give attention to the flame that should not go out. I just that, That's all an honor. It's a wonderful thing. But here's the, here's the deal. There would be a high priest. Aaron was the original high priest, but there'd be a high priest and eventually the high priest would die. And then... Many times the success of the nation was dependent upon the character and the relationship with God that the high priest had. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but some Jewish teachings do. You know, there's other Jewish teachings, you know, uh, outside the Talmud. And, 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 in, those, and in those teachings, they, they tell us this, that when the, <coughs> when the high priest would go into that place called the holy place, there was an outer court where the people could be. But then there was a place beyond the curtain, and only the high priest could go out behind the curtain, but, and he can only go out behind the curtain after certain sacrifices have been made, because that's where the presence of God was. But tradition would say they would tie a rope to the high priest's foot, least he wasn't living right and not survive, and they'd pull him out because nobody else would go in. So it was not a perfect priesthood, but, it was, but, but they could offer up sacrifices for the sin of the nation. And that was important because they were making sacrifices for sin. And I've, I, I've, I've, I've taught this a lot of times, and I think it's a, you know, it's a great analogy that, you know, let's, let's say that, you know, I, I was foolish enough one time to own white carpet, and you, you own white carpet, forgive me, Okay. We put white carpet in our house one time. It really looked good for about two months. And uh, I can't tell you how many times we shampooed it, and every time we shampooed it, it went downhill even faster. But anyway, but l let's say that the kids spilled orange Kool-Aid on this white carpet. Well, what we would do is that we would, you know, we would either place a piece of furniture or carpet over that area, another piece of carpet, you know. And what were we doing? We were hiding it. It was there, but you couldn't see it. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices, that's what it did. It temporarily covered sin, but sin's still there. Sin's still there. Uh, used, to, used to buy and sell cars a lot, and, and uh, so I'd go to the bank and I'd buy a car that I was going to fix up. I'd buy a wreck car and I was going to fix it and sell it and you know, kind of supplement our income. And so I, I, I did a lot of that, and so I'd go buy a car, and I'd buy it on a, you know, many times on a three-month note or a six-month note. And if by chance I didn't get it fixed and sold within that six-month period, I would go in and I'd pay the interest on it. But I still owed the money. Well, that's what the Old Testament sacrifice was. All it did is keep the interest paid on the sins of the nation. So if perfection, see, perfection, uh, forgiveness, cleansing could not be attained through the Levitical priesthood on the basis of the law, which was given to the people, why was there still a need for another priest to come in the order of this guy, right, named Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? Now look with me in Genesis, the 14th chapter. I love talking about Melchizedek. Now, there's only a total of nine scriptures that talks about Melchizedek, but what a role that it plays in scripture. 
Several of them are here are short references, but they, but they say so much. What this is, is a Old Testament picture of Christ. And I, we'll show you in a moment. Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, the, the term Melchizedek means this, king of righteousness. So then the king of righteousness, who was king over Salem, which would have been ancient Jerusalem, all right? Salem. What's, what Salem means? Salem means peace. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought it. What did he bring? Uh, isn't that unique? What did he bring? Now, what did Jesus do at the Last, last Supper? Isn't that good? Yeah. He was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham, the God of the Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then it says this, And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now in another message and another time, I could tell you that this is really where real tithing should be taught from, never out of the law. Okay, but that's another time and that's a whole nother lesson. Okay, so what we have, okay, we're, now let's, before I fill in the blank here, Hebrews 6 20, where the forerunner has entered in before us, Jesus, having become a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now that's a quote from Psalms 110, verse 12. That, 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 that the, the Messiah, the Savior, would be what? There was a forerunner, okay? And, and that forerunner was likened to Jesus. And Jesus, once again, having become a high priest, where? Forever. Now, did Aaron die? Yes. And did the next high priest die? Yes. And so they had, they had a limited priesthood that was always followed by another man. And sometimes, de and dependent upon that man's relationship with God and whether or not he walked godly would impact the nation. It was what? It would, perfection could not be attained of the law. It points out this. The law always points out this. that we're, we, we sin. We fall short. And we can't do it. But Jesus came and fulfilled all the law. He lived righteous. So the forerunner, all right, even Jesus, having become the high priest forever. See, Jesus is the prophet. He's the priest, and he's the king. And so he became a high priest forever according to the order of Mel Melchizedek. Now, it says in Hebrews 7, 3, no one knows who Melchizedek's father and mother is. Now, we know who Aaron's father and mothers were. And down through the ages, they followed their genealogy, and they knew who their father and mother is. But Melchizedek is not mentioned. Now, he's, he's a foreshadow. He's a type of Christ. He's a picture of Christ. Once again, what's his name mean? Melchizedek means that he is the king of righteousness. As Genesis says, he is the king of ancient Salem. Who is Jesus? He is, according to Isaiah, both of these. Isaiah says he is the king of righteousness and he is the prince of peace, Salem. And so after this order of Melchizedek, oh, all right, where's Jesus' beginning and end? Well, you don't know. He always was. We understand his physical birth, but he always was, always will be. Without father and mother, where he came from or where he was born and, and when he died. Melchizedek is like the Son of God. He continues being a priest forever. See, this is really making reference to Jesus. He's what? He's without beginning, all right? He's without beginning, and he's without end. And his priesthood, what? Lasts forever. So we have this unending priesthood. So you and I have been made what? Kings and what priests? And we have a high priest, all right? We belong to his kingdom. Everybody in his kingdom is a what? A king and a priest. There's no slaves in his kingdom. There's no has-beens, was-beens. <coughs> There's just kings and priests. 
a holy nation. Now, in the Old Testament, the duty of the, the priest was this, to make a sacrifice for sin. <clears throat> but in the New Testament, we offer a sacrifice of, of praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says that by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. And that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. And so we, what? We, we show forth the praises. We not only communicate his goodness to others, but we worship him and sing about, and we worship him. The fruit of our lips is a sacrifice that comes before him that is satisfying, that's soothing, that is worthy of who our king and priest is. 1 Peter 2.5 says this, you're also living stones building up a spiritual house. Or he says, or a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Listen to me. I don't know about you. I used to play let's make a deal with God all the time. Have you ever played like God's Monty Hall? Okay. God, I want you to do this. So, and, and listen, if you're doing this right now, you just look straight ahead. Nobody else will know it. And, and, uh, and, and listen, and, and, and I trust rec receive it as graciously as I'd like to say it. And, but I used to play, let's make a deal with God. And so, now I told you I was really quite a legalist. So, so one time I'm wanting God to do something in my life, and I said, God, if you'll do this in my life, I'll give up Coke. Coca-Cola. Coke. I didn't do the other Coke. Coca-Cola, please. Coca-Cola. All right? All right. Thank you. But listen, the other would have been a good sacrifice too, all right? All right. Okay, all right. So, I, I, Lord, I'll, gi I'll give up, up Coca-Cola. I'll give up soda pop if you'll do X, Y, and Z. And, and this is what I do. Every time I needed God to do something, I would, I would say, okay, I'm, I'm going to give up X, Y, and Z. Listen. Lord, I need help with something. I need freedom from this in my life. So I'm going to give up this so you help me out with this. There was only one sacrifice for sin, and it's been made. There are things in my life that I have abandoned. There are things in my life that I, I, I willingly walk away from. And like everyone else, there are some things in my life that I've struggled to overcome. But listen, I, we do that to honor Him. We do that that nothing would, you know, hold any bondage over our lives. But it's not so we can get in. It's not so that we'll be accepted. It was one sacrifice for sin. And Jesus Christ made it. And so we read, this, we read this beautiful verse, and what you and I, what we are able to offer to Him is, is the sacrifice of what? Of praise. Spiritual sacrifices. Words of affirmation and appreciation. Many times we, we you know, we, uh, our, our acts of obedience, I would say our acts of obedience, again, th those are spiritual sacrifices. Hiding His Word in our heart. Those are, all, those are all wonderful things, but we're making what spiritual sacrifices in our lives. And these are, what, these are acceptable unto God. Acceptable unto God. We're building up what? A spiritual house. A holy priesthood. See, what, what you and I belong to is, you, you might say, you, what we're really talking about, more than saying that we belong to, we are talking about the priesthood of the believer that has been provided through Jesus Christ. He has a priesthood that never ends. And he invites us into that. And we, what, we, we build a sanctuary of praise that honors him and, and loves him and adores him. And therefore, the, the, when, we, when we offer a praise to him, it, it comes before him as a sweet-smelling aroma. See, I believe it's this, it's, it's a privilege of a priest to approach God. It's the privilege of the priest to approach God. See, and again, if I go back to the Old Testament, we have a better covenant. 
And again, I thank God that the old, the, the, the old covenant is there. And we still learn from it, and, 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 it's, and it's still speaking to us, and, 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 and I still need it to tell me, thou shalt not. Okay? I, I need that. But I thank God that we've come into the new. And in this new covenant, I, but I, am, able to, I am able to approach God, because under the old covenant, only, only the prophet and the priest and the king heard the voice of God, and only the priest could approach God. The prophet would hear from God, and he would speak to the people. And there were times that God spoke to the king. They had these special offices, and he would speak to the people and lead them. And then, of course, he would speak to the priest, but specifically the priest could do this. The priest had the privilege of entering into the presence of God. And that's why all these sacrifices and all these precautions were taken so he could approach this, this wonderful, yet fearfully done, privilege, approach God. But now there's been this perfect sacrifice made for us. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. John said, I find no fault in him. Wow, I'm already over. Let me pick the pace up, and I could always pick this up next week. Every priest has three things, so I'm not going to get to the end of it. Every priest has three things. He has God's favor, or she. Every priest has access to God's throne. This is his throne. I should have capitalized the H. Always see my typos after I type. And every priest has this, as influence. Let me close with Hebrews 4.16 because of the lateness of the hour, and I'll pick up the priesthood of the believer next week. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace. Now listen, what did I tell you about the Old Testament? They did it how? Fearfully. Fearfully. And should have. That's not my condemnation. That's reality. They went, in, they went in with a certain amount of intrepidation. Now, I can appreciate the awe that they had. I did, boy, I can't. You know, we probably could use a little bit of that awe sometimes. But no need for any intrepidation. Let us therefore come boldly before what? The throne of grace. Why? Because we're priests. And we have what? We have access. And I love this part, Carrie. Eat to obtain what? Mercy. You know what that says to me? Jeremy, even if I miss it, even if I miss it, how do I get to still come? Boldly. Not, not arrogantly. It, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say arrogantly. It doesn't say nonchalant. But when it says boldly, it says this, you're going to get in and you're going to be received. And you're going to be heard. Let us therefore come boldly. So, you know, you know even, if I, if, even if I fail, I can run to the Father. Why? It's a throne of grace. And if I've blown it, I obtain what? Mercy. Mercy. Years ago, Dennis was speaking for me on a Wednesday night. I've never forgot Dennis's definition for these two things. I've adopted them as, as my own. Mercy delivers me from what I deserve. And grace gives me what I do not deserve. That we may obtain mercy and find grace for what? To help in a time of need. Wow, here's this beautiful thing. There's, now, there's a lot more about the priesthood of the believer, but let's just come to this point. This is about you, once again, we belong to this, this chosen generation, this royal priesthood, this holy nation. It is a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. And we declare his goodness to, the, to all of humanity. And we offer up spiritual sacrifices to him. And we're not dependent upon any other man. You know? Listen, I want you to pray for me, and I want to pray for you. Okay? I do. I want you to pray for me. I want to pray for you. But you know what? If you're not around, I'll, I, I, I can get in. And if I'm not around, you can get in. 
because I'm no more of a priest as a pastor than I, you are as somebody who's not in the pulpit. You're just as much as a priest. It's just as, it's just as chosen, it is just as royal, and it is just as holy. And you can go just as boldly. Just as boldly. We may feel guilty. We might be condemned at, at times, but I want you to know he's not doing the condemning. There is no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He does what? He's the forgiver, the restorer. He's the restorer of the breach. He's already made sacrifice for our sin. He's already determined whether or not he's going to forgive us. Ephesians 4.32, the Bible says this to us. He says, be kind and tenderhearted to one another, forgiving one another, even as, Christ, even as God has forgiven you. What's it say? Has forgiven you for Christ's sake. Not will forgive you. He's already made his mind up. You have to appropriate it. You have to ask, but his mind's already made up. He's what? He's forgiving you. And we find grace for help in time of need. Let's pray. I've gone over. Father, just thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your love in our lives. What an honor to be a part of a chosen generation. You, you've chosen us. There was a time you chose Israel, and they're still your people, but you, you've, you've chose us. And Father, you've invited us in through your Son into this kingdom of priests. And Father, we belong to a nation that its nationality is holy. Thank you, God. What a wonderful thing. And, and, and because of that, we, we can come in, not with intrepidation, but with confidence that we can come before the presence of a, a throne of grace unto a loving, loving Heavenly Father, represented by our High Priest, Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for your love that's shown upon us. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and you can be dismissed.